This episode of My Life in Gaming is sponsored by Ipsos iSay. If you aren't familiar, Ipsos is a nearly five decades old market research company, so Ipsos iSay is just a super simple way to voluntarily participate in research surveys and easily earn points towards gift cards. I've got my eye on Amazon, Target, or Walmart because, hey, video games, but there are lots more options too. The surveys are really transparent about how the data is used, and it's easy enough to go through one or two during any downtime you've got like I do when rendering videos. So click the link in our description to start earning rewards with Ipsos I Say today. And now, here's Corey. A couple of years back, I had a lot of fun sharing ROM hacks that I found to be useful and interesting. I vastly prefer hacks that fix bugs streamline certain annoyances, and improve upon the overall experience. I think of them as having a more utilitarian purpose versus, say, some level of ridiculous like this. I thought it might be time to revisit the scene and share some of the bountiful spoils that have been showered upon us over the last several years, as well as shine a light on several that I missed the last go around. So let's once again check out some useful ROM hacks. The ROM hacking scene is booming. We have more ways to play them than ever before. Whether it be using original hardware with reproduction carts, or flash carts like an EverDrive, modding or hacking your console to play backups or burns, software emulation via emulation station, or hardware emulation via a mister or an analog console. This stuff is accessible in all sorts of different ways. This time around, I won't actually be going into how to actually make these hacks. If you crave that information, check out the first ROM hacking video, which should have most of the info that you're looking for. I should probably mention that most, if not all of these ROM hack patches can be downloaded over at romhacking.net. Although, who knows, you might find some pre-hacked version out there somewhere in the ether of the internet, if you know where to look. All right, let's dive in with some of the more egregious emissions from the last video that I caught a bit of flack for leaving out. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 Complete is an extensive improvement hack that goes much further than combining Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles into a single experience. A number of gameplay options let you tailor the adventure in various ways. Some as minor as letting the music continue if you die, to as major as the order of the levels. In a world where Sonic Origins exists, this might lose a tiny bit of its appeal, but I'm sure fans would agree that it's still much better in a whole lot of ways too. Yoshi's Island would be a perfect game if it wasn't for that crying baby. You've probably heard that sentiment before. So now you can just slip that person a ROM hack of Yoshi's Island Pacifier Edition, which silences little baby Mario. Hmm, now that it's gone, I sort of miss it. I've always felt like breaking the blocks in the Super Mario All-Stars version of Mario 1 felt wrong. Like Mario just pushes through the blocks instead of rebounding like he should. As it turns out, I wasn't alone. The Brick Fix patch, try saying that 10 times, makes it feel more like it should. The Castlevania 2 English retranslation plus map hack brings a whole slew of improvements to its constantly criticized shortcomings, creating a much higher tier game in the series. Stuff like a clear translation, opening cinematic, seamless day-to-night transitions, and a world map gives a lot more context to where you are in the world. This is a huge game changer. Last but not least, we have the now iconic Mother 3 English translation, which is considered by many to be one of, if not the best fan translation of all time. Part of me wonders if the reason Mother 3 has never gotten an official translation and release is because Nintendo doesn't think they could do it any better.
One of the most interesting developments in the ROM hacking scene has come from Vitor Vilela's project Fast ROM, which converts Super NES games from slow ROM to fast ROM. <laughs> this allows games to run the system CPU around 33% faster, eliminating slowdown, and it might even result in other improvements. The thing is, you probably won't notice too many outright differences, which I guess is the point. These hacks might simply just make a game feel more responsive. Other times, the benefits will be very obvious, such as with Faceball 2000. It might not seem like much, but this felt pretty impressive to me in 1992. The fast ROM hack makes it a bit smoother and straight up more playable. Thanks to Kondo Wantu, over 60 Super NES games have been converted to fast ROM, with more to come in the future. Check these out and see if you notice any improvements or differences in some of your favorites. Of course, this doesn't mean the end of SA1 hacks. Although they were pretty new when I did the last ROM hacks video, several other titles have been enhanced with this significant upgrade in the last couple of years, such as Contra 3 and Super R-Type. But none of these games benefited more than Race Driving, the follow-up to one of my favorite guilty pleasures, Hard Driving. The SNES original was notorious for its horrendous frame rate, and the SA1 hack is an absolute game changer graphically. Interestingly, the hacked version also extends the instant replay by several seconds. I'm not sure if this was intentional or just a side effect, but it slows the game down in unanticipated ways. I have to say though, despite the obvious improvements, I personally found it to be much more difficult to play, as if the controls were just too touchy now. In the last video, I'd also gotten my first taste of Game Boy colorizations in the form of Super Mario Land DX. In the years since, we've seen a pretty significant boom in these types of hacks. Some really, really impressive. Others, a little bit less so. Kirby's Dream Land, the one that started it all for the little pink puff, got the DX treatment in 2020, and it looks pretty good. At first, I thought the Kirby's signature pink color was off. It was just way too deep and saturated when I was playing on my mister. Turns out, there's two different versions of this hack. One for emulators, and the other one for original hardware. Once I tried the one tailored for emulators, it looked much better. Two of the Game Boy Castlevania games, Castlevania The Adventure and Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge, had colorizations done by Konami themselves for inclusion in the Konami GB collections released in Europe. These hacks can now be applied toward those releases to create full-color standalone versions of each game. I do wish they could have fixed the V-Sync junk with the first game, though. Rounding out the trilogy, we have Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. While not as elaborate as Taurus' work on the first two games, it's still pretty good, even if the colors do feel a bit muted at times. Most recently, the weird but totally unique fifth Game Boy Mega Man game received an exquisitely done colorization in late 2022 called Mega Man World 5 DX, a play on the Japanese title of the same game. The vibrant colors really make this feel like a brand new game. There's even more colorizations out there, such as Kid Icarus DX and Metroid 2 DX although they don't seem quite as thorough of a conversion. Some of my favorite ROM hacks are those that are so completely inconsequential that you'd never even know that they were there unless you were told about it. 
I really like the idea that one little thing about a game got stuck in someone's craw enough that they just had to do something about it. The speed up hack for Ashura, aka Rambo First Blood Part 2, aka Secret Command on the Master System, speeds up movement when you move left or right. I can see the appeal, but it felt like it makes the game way more difficult to play. There's one hack for Animaniacs on the Genesis that restores the sound test to the option screen. Kind of makes you wonder why Konami felt the need to remove it in the first place. This one really cracks me up. A hack that changes the color of Link's hair in Zelda 3: A Link to the Past from pink to brown. Now, I get why this was done, but it just looks wrong to me. I don't know, anyone else feel the same? Road Rash 1 and 2 were hacked to save your game to SRAM every time you complete a set of five levels. I never knew I wanted something like this until it existed. In fact, SRAM save improvement hacks continue to be one of my favorite types of hacks. Game Ground on the Genesis has an SRAM hack to save high scores. Mylon's Secret Castle on the NES pulled a Metroid and starts you with a small amount of health every time you continue, and you'd have to grind to refill it every single time. The full health hack starts you, obviously, with full health when you start a new game and every time you continue. This one speaks directly to me. The Super Bomberman No Walk Sounds hack. Footstep sound effects annoy me so much in 2D games for some reason that I can't quite understand it. But this one is annoying on a whole other level. You know, if there's a hack to remove similar effects in other games, then I will happily use it every time. Updated rosters for classic sports games is one of the huge benefits of ROM hacks that probably doesn't get enough credit, especially when such a thing would be paid DLC these days. You'd be hard pressed to find a better hockey game than good old NHL 94. With NHL 94 2023 edition, you get current players, stats, and teams in a classic package. I honestly can't imagine how long this took to do, since it seems to include headshots of some of these players and has the new team logos in there. If we're talking about NHL hockey, check out the wide mode hacks for the different annual entries on the Genesis that increases the game's resolution and opens up the field of view significantly. With this hack, almost the entire horizontal width of the rink can be seen on screen at once. Although it was and continues to be the butt of fifth generation console war jokes, there's some people out there who feel very strongly about Quest 64 being a pretty good game. Maybe it is, I really haven't played it that much. But the meter on those chances increases ever so slightly with the release of the Quest 64 French vanilla hack. Despite its name, <laughs> this isn't a French translation or anything. Instead, it's an overall quality of life enhancement that has loads of changes from damage balancing to enemy item drop frequency, making it way more playable. Especially for those who have a hard time adjusting to 20 plus year old gameplay quirks. Although good intentioned, I never felt that the remake of Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes on the GameCube, came close to the original PS1 classic. The retrofitted gameplay mechanics just broke too much of the level design, but that just scratches the surface. Another slip up was the complete replacement of the soundtrack, giving us something more akin to the feel of Metal Gear Solid 2. Although not much can be done about the other elements, hacker Afrojack X has done what he could to restore the music from the PS1 classic into the Twin Snakes to great effect. <laughs> Pretty 
prolific ROM hacker, Infidelity has brought us a slew of incredible overhauls and improvements for years now. The last couple of years, he's been focusing on something a little different, porting the NES games Mega Man 4 and most recently Mega Man 2 to the Super NES. The fact that these ports were done essentially entirely by hand in hexadecimal makes it even more impressive. The more powerful hardware enables the expected upgrades, such as reduced, but not completely eliminated, sprite flicker. Of course, there's going to be some unavoidable differences too, such as the sound and music having to be emulated on the SNES hardware, which makes them sound a little bit different. New tweaks, fixes, and updates are being actively worked on, so most of the kinks should be worked out soon enough. An MSU1 version of the Mega Man 4 port is already out there, which incorporates CD music pulled from the arcade fighting games and the PS1 ports. Mega Man 2 should be getting an MSU1 version shortly. Now, it's fan translation time, and let me tell you, we are living in a renaissance of fan translations, localization cleanups, and ports of official translations from one platform to another. It seems like a new big one is being announced every single week, and there's something out there for everyone. In the 90s, you might have read about Tokimeki Memorial in game magazines who would deride it as being a weird dating sim. But here in 2023, we have the guidance of Tim Rogers to tell us about how wrong they all were and how good it actually is over the course of six hours. So while I'd prefer the PS1 or Saturn version, I'll take the fan translation of the Super Famicom version of Tokimeki, I'm sorry, Heartthrob Memorial in the meantime. So cool to finally play this, but can't say I'm a big fan of the font choice here. I'm not sure if this came down to certain resolution limitations, but it's uh, not great. Additionally, on the Konami front, the recently released translation of the Super Famicom version of Parodius is pretty funny. Not that my expectations were sky high or anything like that, but I really got a kick out of the options you can choose from on the continue screen. Eh, let's not. Ted Woolsey's Final Fantasy III script is an absolute classic, if you ask me. But if some of the censoring in that script, no matter how silly it is, bothered you, then Ted Woolsey's Final Fantasy VI Uncensored is exactly what you're looking for. Now, I've brought up the Fantasy Star retranslation before in other videos but I haven't had a chance to talk about the 2.0 update that came out in 2020. Here, not only do you get a refined script with additional names, info, and references in there, but you also now have a number of modifiers to streamline the experience, such as having the number of battles, increased walk speed, and multiplying experience and money per battle. A font choice, sound test, and uh, being able to choose whether or not Alice's sprite's hair color matches the cutscenes and the title screen. Sure, the Switch Sega Ages version with the built-in mapping system might make the game more palatable for newcomers, but this is a great way to experience the game on original hardware. Then there's Fantasy Star Generation 4 from Galleon Unlimited. This is a retranslation and a relocalization. And not that the original was bad or anything like that, but one thing that's always bothered me is how names and various other pieces of lore were altered from game to game. This brings a lot of that back in line with previous entries. There is two different flavors of this hack, one for purists and another one which takes a few working designs-esque liberties with the writing.
But for all the goings on in the world of cartridge game translations, the most exciting stuff has been cropping up on CD and DVD based consoles. The PlayStation 1 has some goodies you gotta check out. Harmful Park is an absolutely stunning Japanese exclusive side scrolling shooter with amazing pixel art and a completely nonsensical storyline. If you don't speak the language and want to follow along with the madness, then the fan translation is exactly what you need. Wow, this game is absolutely awesome, but it is so, so expensive. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead in Virtual Stupidity is a scum-styled point-and-click adventure that is far superior to its SNES and Genesis counterparts. In the US, it was released only on the PC, while in Japan, there was a PS1 port. Except, on that version, all the voices were redubbed in Japanese. Freya! 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 Whoa! Now, yeah, this is entertaining in its own right, but if you wanted to play the console version in English, then you were out of luck. That is, until the release of this patch, which takes the English audio and text and puts them in the PS1 game. Now, if you're a fan, which I definitely am, then this is a real treat. <laughs> it's like a jail for air. <laughs> of course, that's not all. Stepping in to help me out on this front is Digital Foundry's John Linneman, who's gonna show off some of the big names that have cropped up on the Sega Saturn, where things might even be more interesting and exciting. I love the Sega Saturn, but as anyone familiar with its history knows, it didn't exactly set the sales charts on fire here in the West. In Japan, however, it found a huge following and became the most successful Sega console in that territory. As a result, more than 75% of the system's library remains exclusive to Japan. Given the sheer volume of role-playing games in that mix though, many of its best games are difficult to truly enjoy if you cannot read or understand Japanese. Which is why the Sega Saturn fan translation scene has become so welcome, with many of the system's heavy hitters now fully playable in English thanks to their hard work. One of the most welcome releases has to be the original Grandia. Created by Game Art specifically for the Sega Saturn hardware, Grandia only ever saw release in the West via a graphically inferior PlayStation port, or the more recent HD version, which is also based on the PlayStation port. Thanks to Saturn Wrangler extraordinaire, Trekkies Unite 118 as he's called, the original version is now fully playable in English on the Saturn. The basic idea was to simply adapt the English script that exists on PlayStation, but correct some of the typos, remove unnecessary cuts, and retain the original Japanese voice acting. Saturn Dave from the Shiro podcast was even kind enough to make this for me, a replica of Grandia that resembles what an official US Sega Saturn release might have looked like. It includes the English translation, of course, and it all feels remarkably authentic. He even included a full color manual and a map. Thanks Dave, you rock. But this is really just the beginning. An even more impressive translation effort has to be Hudson's Balk Slash. This fast paced mech action game is an impressive feat of engineering for the old Sega Saturn, but it happens to rely heavily on a mix of Japanese text and voiced lines, making it difficult to enjoy without at least some knowledge of Japanese. I did a whole live stream of this game on Digital Foundry with some of the team members on this project, but basically these guys went above and beyond. The entire game was translated into English and fully dubbed. Yeah, they even went through the entire process of re-recording everything in full English and it is glorious. Seriously, listen to the quality of this voice acting here. Leone Rhodes, Sergeant First Class Reporting. I'm here to help, Chris. But that's not all. They've even added full support for the Sega Saturn Twin Stick, a controller designed for use with Virtual On. If you have one of these bad boys lying around, you can now enjoy Bulk Slash in a whole new way, and it is just fantastic. 
Now, one of the most popular games on the Sega Saturn in Japan is Sakura Tyson, or Sakura Wars. This high-budget fusion of visual novel, dating sim, and tactical RPG was a tremendous hit, but America just wasn't ready for it back in the 90s, I suppose, so it never got a translation. That is, until Noah Steam and his merry band got together to release a patch allowing you to enjoy the game in English. Now you too can experience the magic of Sakura Wars. The attention to detail here is simply superb. The menus, graphics, and the entire script have all been transformed into something that actually feels like an official product that could have existed, maybe even better than what we might have gotten back in the day. And that same team is already hard at work on Sakura Wars 2. There's a demo available right now even if you're curious to try it, but it's fantastic to see this series getting so much love all these years later either way. Okay, but what about games that did make their way to the West on PlayStation, but also happened to receive Saturn conversions in Japan? Vandal Hearts is a fantastic tactics game from Konami, which happened to receive a Saturn port for some reason, much like Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Suikoden before it. But thankfully, this just happens to be the best port of the three, without the visual scaling issues from Castlevania or the horrendous loading times of Suikoden. Lunar Silver Star Story was remastered for the 32-bit generation from the Mega CD originally, but we only ever received the working designs release on the original PlayStation, so this is fantastic news for Saturn fans. Oh, and how could I not mention Police Knots? This is effectively Hideo Kojima's follow-up to Snatcher, the legendary graphic adventure. As a graphic adventure, however, this one would have been difficult to enjoy if you don't speak the language, but now, like the rest, it's fully playable in English right on your Saturn. Now, these are just some of the highlights, but really, there's a lot more out there too. The Saturn's library is truly phenomenal, and it's great to see so many talented folks working hard to bring these experiences to more people. Whether you have an original Sega Saturn console, or you prefer to use emulation, it's time to play some Sega Saturn. All right, thanks for that, John. I'm excited to finally play that Police Knots translation in the upcoming months. And now, to wrap things up, it's variety time. There's a large number of hacks that I wanted to mention, but because they didn't quite fit into any one category, I figured that I'd just throw them all in together. <laughs> After four years of development, Gabriel Pyron's nearly complete overhaul of the subpar Genesis version of Street Fighter II finally went public during the summer of 2020. And dang, it is absolutely fantastic. The amount of love and work that went into this project is staggeringly apparent, giving us a glimpse of what is possible if you have a clear grasp of the system's capabilities and, more importantly, time. The laundry list of improvements include, most obviously, an all-new life bar HUD, font, more color, and improved portrait and stage graphics. Underneath the surface, some damage values and bug fixes have been implemented as well. Lastly, voice quality has been improved significantly, although it still doesn't come close to the clarity of the Super NES version. You win! Perfect! Another fighting game overhaul is the Arcade Edition hack for the 32X version of Mortal Kombat 2. What originally felt like squandered potential has finally achieved its true form by restoring sound effects, voices, and combos, as well as improving effects and graphical flourishes throughout. I also appreciate the option to make the CPU not be as annoying to fight after the third match on the ladder. Finish him. Fatality. Continuing on the 32X, I'd be an idiot if I left out Doom 32X Resurrection, which is absolutely insane. This is a complete overhaul, no, no, wait, a complete engine replacement of Doom on the 32X 
that makes what was once frustratingly janky in so many ways into a showpiece of the 32X's brute power. Porting the engine used in the Jaguar and 3DO versions, everything has had a massive, massive upgrade from frame rate, viewing screen size, a redone soundtrack, new graphical assets, control tweaks to let you take advantage of a six button controller, save RAM support. Seriously, I could go on and on here, but the results speak for themselves. I mean, just look at it. It seems crazy that this can even be patched onto the original ROM. Now, if you want a real deep dive on both Doom 32X Resurrection and Mortal Kombat 2 Arcade Edition 32X, then check out Sega Lord X, who has some great videos on those very subjects. Lastly, I would normally leave something like this out, but it was just too good to ignore. I'm talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Re-Revenge. <laughs> This hack for Streets of Rage 2 drops in the sprites from Tribute's 2022 brawler, TMNT Shredder's Revenge. Now, on paper, that sounds completely silly, but thanks to how Tribute tends to conform their sprites to a traditional pixel grid, all it took was an extremely talented group of hackers to make this work. And it works exceptionally well. Everyone is here, even Casey Jones. As far as I could tell, they have all their moves, although there are some concessions that needed to be made in order to work within the context of Streets of Rage 2. For instance, there aren't any weapon pickups in Shredder's Revenge, so no animation exists for holding a weapon. In Re-Revenge, if you try to pick up a weapon, then the hack has been programmed to make it so that you'll automatically just drop it on the ground. That makes sense. Initially, this hack felt off to me because the gameplay of a TMNT game didn't quite work with the speed of a typical Streets of Rage game. But once I was advised to jump into the option mode and turn on turbo, then that made a world of difference and everything feels perfectly tuned now. Still, Streets of Rage music didn't quite jive with the feel of a TMNT game. And that is where friend of the show, Show, stepped in and created a MSU MD and MD Plus audio version that injects some much needed Turtles tunes where they belong. The whole thing is so cohesive now and works better than you'd ever expect. Well, I guess that should be enough to keep you occupied for another three years or so. A huge thank you to all of our friends on the My Life in Gaming Discord who suggested a chunk of these hacks. And now, as I said before, there's so many of these out there and all sorts of new ones arriving every day that it's hard to keep up. Feel free to let me know about some of your favorites that I might have missed so that I can earmark them for a future episode. And to everyone who works on these hacks, you are the absolute best. It's your dedication and passion that keeps this scene thriving, and I cannot wait to see what you all have in store for the future. Mm -hmm.